Good morning. I can't believe they let me come back up here after the last time. <clears throat> Would uh, you please stand as we uh, read God's word? Rejoice always, <clears throat> continually give thanks in all circumstances. And this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit, do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. <clears throat> Hold to what is good, reject everything kind, reject every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless for the coming of our Lord Jesus. The one who calls you is the faithful. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Thank you. You may be seated. Thanks, KJ. Well, uh, Satan and Jesus were having an argument. It was an ongoing argument. The, the argument was... Who was the best at the computer? Satan thought he was and Jesus thought he was. God finally got tired of the argument and set up a contest. He said, we're going to have a contest and we're going to find out who is best at working on the computer. And so they began to work. They did um, emails and they did PowerPoints and they did spreadsheets and they wrote letters and documentation and posters and so on and so on and so on. And the contest was almost over when a bolt of lightning struck across the sky and a clap of thunder and guess what happened the power went out right they sat there for a few minutes moaning and groaning and all of a sudden after a while the power began to come back on and Satan looked at his computer and he began to scream no it's all gone I can't find it meanwhile Jesus was calmly at his computer printing out all of his work I know you've heard this before and he goes Satan goes how did he do that he cheated God he cheated God and God said no he didn't cheat the fact of it is, is that Jesus saves. <laughs> Think about it, you'll figure it out. Jesus saves. It's kind of annoying, but I have learned the hard way that I have automatically set my computer to save every 10 minutes. Anything that I do. Well, we know that the economy is bad sometimes, and, and we're busy, and yes, there's stress, and there's weariness, and there's not enough hours in the day, and, and yes, there's a lot of things we're supposed to be doing, doing, it doesn't seem to be enough time or energy to do them. However, if we keep our focus where it's supposed to be, 100% on Jesus Christ, and the hope gives, the hope that he gives, I guarantee you that we'll find miracles taking place in our lives. Believe me, God has a book full of good stuff for his church, for this church. How do we know that it's available to us? It's very simple, because Jesus saves. Jesus loves us, he cares about us, and the Bible says, well, if, he, if God who sent his son to die for us, won't he graciously give us everything that we need to survive this life? That's the New E.B. translation, but that's a, pretty much what it says, because Jesus loves us. Well, if nothing else happens when we come together, if, a, if for a few minutes we take our mind off of ourselves and focus on God with, with joy and thanksgiving, I promise you that something special will happen. We know the result of praise, don't we? Do you know what happens when we praise? God's here. I guarantee you this. If you're going through a struggle, a, a time where you can't seem to make connection with God, if you will intentionally praise him and worship him, intentionally focus. I know it's hard when we don't feel like doing it. It's hard to do it. But if you will do that, I guarantee you that God will come and touch you. Because God inhabits, according to the scripture, the praise of his people. So here's where we need to focus. I am so busy, God, that I don't have enough time to get everything done that I'm supposed to get done. No, I thank you, God, that you created the day the way you created it, and there are enough hours in every day to accomplish what really needs to be accomplished. Or how about this? Father, I, I just don't know what to do. I don't have enough money. I can't make ends meet. Lord, I thank you because you have given me everything that I need to survive according to your riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Lord, I'm not talented. I really would like to help. There's just nothing that I can do. Lord, I thank you that I have two hands that I can help keep your house in order. And I have a voice to sing your praises. And I have the ability to tell other people about how much you love them. 
See, we take the focus off ourselves and all the things that we have to do, and, and we focus on him. There is nothing more powerful than looking the devil in the eye in the midst of all the stuff and laughing with the abandonment of joy knowing that Jesus is in control. You're going, that is tough. How in the world do we do that? Well, as I was preparing for this sermon today, I I ran across, uh, we were talking about joy, and I ran across 350 verses that talk about joy. I read every one of them. And then I discovered there's over 500 texts Oops. There are five, over 500 texts that are happy texts that talk about rejoicing and, and having to do with joy. Almost every author spoke of the joy of the Lord and how it's our strength. And they also, as I begin to read through that, the joy that the early Christians had, no matter what they were going through, sometimes seemed to be 180 degrees from the joy that a lot of quote-unquote Christians today profess to have. Do you know what I'm talking about? You've heard me quote the words before of the, of the Florida Boys song. I won't do it, but it's, if you're happy, notify your face. If Jesus is your Lord, tell it to the human race. Take that frown off and put a smile in its place. If you're happy, notify your face. Do you know anyone who claims, oh, there's the worst thing in the world as we're going, oh, hallelujah. Oh, praise God. I mean, is that how you do it? Is that what's going to happen when you get to heaven? Oh, wow, look, there's Jesus. Yay. I mean, is anyone interested in that kind of relationship? The joy that we come from him not just should, be, should not just be reflected in our worship, but it should be reflected in our everyday lives. Well, in this letter to the Thessalonians, Paul gives some commands to help us keep our focus where it belongs. The church of his day was facing turmoil within and persecution from without. And Satan was working overtime to to shift the focus onto the stuff rather than on the Lord. In the midst of all that, Paul gives the cure, and I call it the gratitude beatitude. It's very simple. It has three parts. Be happy or be joyful. Pray without ceasing and give thanks. And I'm sure that sounded to them pretty much like it sounds to us today. Oh, sure. It's easy for you to say, Paul. You aren't living where we're living. But if we'll grab a hold of it, I mean really grab a hold of these commands. These aren't just, these aren't just uh, invitations. These are commands from God that have far-reaching effects beyond the words. It will help us become the people and the church that God wants us to become. So the first one, it's pretty easy. This is a, I've been, uh, I'm preaching a, preaching, I'm teaching a preaching class to students on our district, some young MITs. This is one of the texts that we talked about because it really makes it easy for a three-point sermon, doesn't it? The first is this. It's a joyful church. I mean, we're a joyful church, aren't we? One author has said this. One can never truly know happiness who has not been sad. One can't fully understand the power of Christ to change, to heal, to revitalize unless we've been touched in this way. We can never know the joy of being rescued from a life of sin and death unless we come face to face with the reality that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Something incredible happens in our lives when we know, I mean we know, we know deep down in our hearts that Jesus saves. Isn't that true? What does it look like when we're joyful? The author is talking about joy and he's talking about it as an attitude and, and not an emotion. You guys know this song, I've got the joy, 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 where? And how long is it going to be there? To stay. The joy is in my heart. The devil doesn't like it, but it's down in my heart, right? It's there to stay. I love it when people rejoice. Where two or three are gathered together, there is joy. Do you believe it? If you haven't experienced, uh, you've experienced that, you've missed so much of what God has in store for his church. In the book of Nehemiah, the people had come together. After all of those years, the walls of, Jeru- the walls of Jerusalem were crashed down, and they had come together, and, and they had worked hard, and they had built the walls. And after the walls were up, 
Nehemiah gathered all the people together and they read the book of the law. They read the, the, the words of the Lord for the people. And, and it says when they heard the, the words of God, they were weeping because it affected them in such a powerful way. And, but then the weeping changed to rejoicing. And in that joy, they found strength. See, when God's people come together, we experience, at least we should, and it's, it's here, safety. We call it sanctuary. It's safety and it's secure. And it's here that we find peace and hope and freedom and joy. You need to understand today that Satan cannot enter into God's sanctuary unless someone brings him with him. This is God's church. This is God's place. And we experience, I know we call this building a sanctuary, but we experience sanctuary, and Satan is not welcome here. So if you are experiencing those kind of things in your life, if you're feeling those kind of things, guess where the source is? It's not from God. It's not from God. Through the power of God's Spirit, listen to me this morning, all fear, all confusion, all discord, all strife, and I add this one for me because I get here sometimes, all grumpiness is banished. Do you know that we have the power to do that in our own lives? In the lives of our, our, our first us, our families, and our church, we banish those things in Jesus' name. We agree together as God's church that those things are gone. This is God's house, and we have come together intentionally to worship him. And when we do that, you know what? Satan has to flee. The second thing is it's a praying church. We've talked quite a bit about it. I won't take as long with that. The command is to pray without ceasing. I, I think many people need an attitude adjustment about prayer. If we're really honest with ourselves, most people only pray when they need something from God. Maybe it's a mealtime prayer, a bedtime prayer, or, or a habit of prayer, or, or that time when they're in trouble and they need something. But if I read the scripture correctly, it says we are to pray all the time. Now, I realize that we can't be on our knees every moment of every day, can we? Now, I imagine that probably some of us need to spend more time there than we actually do. But it means that we are in, be, to be in constant communication with God. Just as you spend time with your best friend... Do you know what I'm talking about? You share your deepest secrets, your hurts and your joys and even the trivial things of life. We need to communicate with God in that same way. God cares about all of the stuff, the little stuff and the big stuff. He cares about you. It's kind of like keeping your cell phone on all the time. I'm not saying you need to be talking on your cell phone all the time, but you keep it on all the time. You're just waiting for that call, that text from God. Do you know that if you anticipate and you in set yourself up to receive it, God will talk to you? He'll do it through the radio, through a song. He'll do it through scripture. He'll do it through a bird that flies by. He'll do it through someone speaking words to you that you just, they don't have a clue what they're doing, but, but they gave you just exactly what you needed. You ever experienced that? That's God <laughs> speaking to us when we're open and available to listen. Something happens when we pray. I can't really explain why it does or how it does, but you know it and I do it. Many of you in this place have experienced miracles in your life through prayer. We were talking about Mike, and I, I think that one of the things that Satan does to us is he, he puts a spirit of forgetfulness that sounds so benign, but, but Mike, God touched him and healed his knee. Praise God. Then he forgot to tell us. And he's the prayer chain guy. <laughs> and we talked about it. I believe that is Satan working overtime. He doesn't want that good stuff to be out there. But we need to put that out too, don't we? So we can rejoice together where God has come and touched and healed. You need to understand that I believe praying together is the most powerful, life-affecting, church-changing thing, thing that we can do. Do you believe that? Well, at least a couple of amens. Come next Saturday. I will be here to pray with you and for you. 
When we come together and pray together, something happens. See, here's the thing. Let me just take a little side note. Do you understand that praying is really not about me? Not me as pastor, but me as in us. The purpose of praying is not to get something from God. The purpose of praying is to get God. And if you come in here with a chip on your shoulder or an attitude about whatever it is, guess what? It's going to affect what happens when you pray. But if we come together with expectation about what God is going to do for us, imagine what happens when God does something for us. Our faith is built and built and built. I'm not trying to scold. What I'm trying to say is prayer is the most important thing that we can do. Prayer together. Well, the last one today is this. It's a thankful church. You know, there's always something to be thankful for. Did you know that? Even on dark days, there are blessings to count. Do you remember this song? Count your blessings. Name them one by one. Count your blessings. See what God has done. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. Count your many blessings. See what God has done. In Philippians, we are commanded to give thanks in everything. So, I want us to stop right now for a minute. Right in the middle of the sermon. (laughs) And think of one thing that you're thankful for. In a minute, I'm going to give you a chance to say it out loud. All together, I'm not going to put anyone on the spot. I'm going to go one, two, three, and we're all going to say them together. But can you think of one thing that you're thankful for? I mean, your health, your family, friends, salvation. If you're having trouble, how about the last breath you took? Or the fact that you're here today and not in the hospital. So have you got one? One thing. One thing that you're thankful for. Let's say it together. One, two, three. Jesus. And I bet you we can go on and on and on. I ran across this. I thought I'd share it today. When you think things are bad, when you feel sour, feel sour and blue, when you start to get mad, you should do what I do. Just tell yourself, ducky, you're really quite lucky. Some people are much more, oh, ever so much more, oh, much, leave much, much more unlucky than you. Pretty good gospel from Dr. Seuss. You know the kind of people. Yeah, the... Well, we call them Eeyore, right? They said, cheer up, things could be worse. So I cheered up, and sure enough, things got worse. (laughs) There are blessings to count every single day. See, here's where we often short-circuit in the relationship with Christ and with others. It happens when we get our focus on us and not on him. Uh, Imagine this. We say we come together... On Sundays, we come together into this place to do what? To worship Him. I mean, that's why we come. We have come together to worship Him. And I have to ask a question. When we come together, do we really worship Him? Do we get so caught up in the stuff that's going on around us that we forget that we're here to worship Him? Hmm. The truth is, it's all about Him. I mean, I mean, it really is. I may not look like it now, but I used to play a lot of basketball, and actually I did pretty good. If I do say so myself, for a short white guy. It wasn't too bad. And someone gave me a shirt because they knew that I liked basketball. Um, well, I, I can tell some stories about that. I ran across this basketball. It was one of my favorite pictures. <laughs> But I had a t-shirt that someone gave me because they knew I loved to play basketball, and it said, basketball is life. Everything else is details. Now, we know that's not true. We know, um, (laughs) we change it. Christ is life. Everything else is basketball. I mean, that makes more sense to me at the time. But no matter what we put in that place, whether it's basketball or or golf or hunting or work or family or friends or even uh, anything, even legitimate things, the fact is we were created to worship him. I live to worship him. I mean, isn't that what it says in Romans 12? 
Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable act or your spiritual act of worship. We were created to worship him. That's why we're here. So this is more appropriate. Jesus is life. The rest is just details. God doesn't want us to get caught up in the details and miss the point, does he? I know I've probably said this before, but you remember, if you turn your back on the sun, you see all the shadows. But when you turn and face the sun, guess where the shadows go? All behind you. So Paul concludes the comments here in just this one verse and says, oh, by the way, this really isn't my idea, even though I'm the one giving the command. This is God's will for you. Here it is. Don't worry. Be happy, happy, pray. Give thanks to God no matter what happens. Try it and see if it, what kind of dividends it will pay. Not just because it's a command, because this is God's will for you. Well, we've all at one time or another, gone through a study of the Lord's Prayer. And you know what the key to the Lord's Prayer is? There's one key part. They're all important. But it's this phrase, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. You see, that's God's will for us. His will being done is that we live with a gratitude attitude. Happiness is not a station we arrive at, but a manner of traveling. Watch this as we close today. I woke up this morning and was greeted by the sunrise. I made a simple meal and enjoyed a moment of peace and stillness. I stepped into my vehicle and joined a million others traveling to work today. And I arrived safely. I spent most of the day at my job, doing the same familiar tasks that greet me every day. The work that provides for my needs. I took a walk in the park and received a smile from a stranger. I picked up a few groceries. I spoke with my parents. And then I met a friend for coffee. I turned on the radio in my car. I sent a message to someone a thousand miles away. I washed my clothing. I returned home. A very ordinary day. Everything I've experienced today could be considered unremarkable they are all profound blessings, the fingerprints of your hand. Help me to grasp the wonder in the small and the simple, to notice the miracles which surround me constantly, to see the beauty in the commonplace and take nothing for granted. Teach me to make gratitude a lifestyle, one which flows into love, rejoicing, and thankfulness every moment that I draw breath. Amen. Please stand with me. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for all the blessings and the ways that you take care of me that I uh, totally take for granted. 
I pray that somehow as we move through this week and head toward Thanksgiving today, set aside specifically to give thanks to you, that, that we truly would not just breeze through it like we do so often, but we would truly be thankful. I pray that we would have a, a gratitude attitude, <laughs> that we would look for those blessings in everyday life, just like in this little short video, and that we would intentionally on purpose and with purpose, give thanks. Father, I pray that you would uh, bless us as we leave. I know there are ones who need your special touch. I just pray that you would continue to work in their lives and in their hearts. But I pray that you would help us to be intentional witnesses, even today, as we go out into uh, some to eat restaurants and some to go in homes and, and whatever it is that we need to do today. I just pray that we would be intentional witnesses for you. I pray that we would be so in love with you and so filled with all that you've done for us that it would just overflow and splash onto those around us. Thank you, Father, most of all for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, who makes life not just possible, but makes it incredible. Forgive us for taking it for granted. I just pray that you would uh, bless these folks. <laughs> As I heard one old guy pray one time, Father, he said, Lord, I pray that you would bless us near to death, but not quite. <laughs> In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.